Hi, I'm Kelly Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. And this is our regular weekly message. Today we're continuing our series entitled Faith Revisited. And this message is part eight. And it is entitled Confident in Your Faith. I want you to turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 3. We're going to read verse 1 through 12. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. The ninth hour is 3 p.m. 3 p.m. is the hour of the daily sacrifice, the hour that the Passover lamb was sacrificed. It's also the hour that Jesus died when he died upon the cross. These times, 3 a.m., sometimes after 3 a.m., the, the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came walking on the water to meet his disciples. It was sometime around there. It is becoming a phenomenon, if you would, would look, that at 3 a.m., something happens where God will wake up his people. He will wake them up to pray or to intercede. I know that's happened to me on several occasions. And um, it happened to other people. And not just Christians alone, but people have been waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning to do a certain thing. And I'm sure that many of you have probably experienced that same thing at 3 o'clock in the morning. The other hour is 3 p.m. 3 p.m. is the ninth hour. And I've mentioned several events that, that took place at 3 p.m., including the death of Jesus on the cross. 9 a.m. is the other hour. At 9 a.m., that is the third hour. The hour that the Holy Spirit was given to the church. That's when the Holy Spirit came screaming to earth at 9 o'clock in the morning, the third hour. And apparently, it was the time of the morning sacrifice as well. It was the hour that Jesus was nailed to the cross. Now, as I've mentioned, Jesus came to his disciples walking on the water at the fourth watch of the night, which is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Now, could it be that when the scripture says in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Now, could it be, and I'm just, I'm just wondering here, could it be that this verse is actually referring to the hours of, uh, the hours between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Take a look at this Talmud daily sacrifice, also known as the perpetual sacrifice. On the left side, we have the Jewish time, and on the right side, we have the Roman time. So the first hour, that's what the Jews called it, the first hour. At that time, the first lamb is to be brought out and it's tied to the altar. And it waits there for three hours. That, that first hour corresponds with dawn or 6 a.m., 6 o'clock in the morning. That's when the priests prepare the altar for sacrifice. It, it's the first thing in the morning that they do. Then at the third hour, 9 a.m., the first lamb, that lamb that was brought out at 6, is now sacrificed at 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock is also the first hour of prayer. The temple gates are open and the Jewish people, they come in to have prayer. The sixth hour, the second lamb, the evening sacrifice is now brought out and it is tied to the altar. This time is, this, this uh, sixth hour is noon. It's 12 o'clock. Noon is the second hour of prayer. Now comes the ninth hour. The ninth hour is the evening sacrifice. Is the second lamb is sacrificed 
at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. is the third hour of prayer, also called the hour of confession. But in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, which we just read, it talks about the hour of prayer. John and Peter, and Peter and John was going up to, to the temple at the hour of prayer. That was at 3 o'clock. And also Acts chapter 10, verse 9. This chart just gives us a, a view of the significance of these hours. 6 o'clock. 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, then again at 3 o'clock. All right, let's move on to verse 2. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expected to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power of piety we have made him walk? It was the ninth hour of the day. The hour of prayer. It was 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Peter and John were on their way to the temple to pray because it was the hour of prayer. And so were many other devout Jews. They were on their way to the temple because it was the hour of prayer. Knowing that foot traffic would be heavy around that time because of these people going up to pray, those who were devoted, those people who... who who still called on the name of Yahweh. They went up to pray at this time. And these people knew it, that a lot of people would be coming in at this hour to pray. So either family members or friends brought this lame man and laid him or sat him down at the gate that is called beautiful. It was his best opportunity, they thought, to be successful at the only thing this man could do, and that was to beg because he was crippled and could not walk. Therefore, he could not hold a job. So they placed him there just as Peter and John were about to enter the gate. It could be that they hadn't even gone away as yet when Peter and John came strolling in. It could be that the same people who had laid this man here turned around to look when they heard Peter say, look at us. Maybe they turned around to see how much their friend or their family member would receive from these two guys who were just walking in. They looked like they were well-dressed, so he would probably receive a good bit of money. Because after all, they said, look at us. So, so that indicated to them probably that they were going to give him a sizable donation. But their hearts probably dropped as hope drifted out, as it fleeted away when Peter said, I don't have any silver. I don't have any gold. And they probably thought, well, why did you tell Bobby to look at you then? But their spirits began to revive when Peter continued. But what I do have, that I will give you. At, at last, 
At last, something was beginning to happen for their friend and their family member. And they had something. They were going to give them something. And it sounds like it might be a good something. Then they were blown away. As was Bubba. Bubba was blown away when, when they heard Peter say, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up, get up, and walk. It always amazes me when I read this portion of scripture or when I think about it. I think about those events. I, I listen to what Peter say and I think about what Peter said. Peter said, silver and gold. I do not have. I don't have any money. But what I do have, give I unto you. There was no doubt in Peter's mind, nor were there any doubt in John's mind. They were in solidarity together in that fact. I don't have any money. We don't have any money. We don't even have any coupons. I don't have any buy one, get one free coupon for you that I could even help you out. Look, man, I am broke right now. As far as silver and gold is concerned, I'm flat broke. But I have something much better, much, much better. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up, get up, and walk. Then Peter stretched out his hand and took a hold of this lame man and lifted him to his feet. Peter had taken what he had heard. He had mixed it with Ohopistus, the faith. There was no doubt in his mind that what he said would come to pass, that what he believed would come true, that that mountain would be moved. He had the Holy Spirit working inside him. Then he took what he had mixed, the hearing, the faith, and he put it into action. He put it into action by reaching out his hand and taking hold of that lame man and standing him to his feet. James said in James chapter 2 verse 17, so also faith by itself, if does not have works, is dead. He said, if it ain't got works, it ain't no good. See, James in his statement, uses the same term, oho, or hopistis, the faith. Therefore, this means that having the faith is useless unless you put it into words. If you just have that hopistis, the faith, living inside you somewhere, it's useless. It, it, it's no good. You might as well not even have it unless you put it to work. Understand that it is not just enough to have this hopistus, the faith. It must be employed. It must be put to work. We must put our faith where our mouth is. We must put our faith where our hands are. We must put our faith where our feet are. For we are the body of Christ. The early disciples turned the whole world upside down because they did just that. They put their faith into action. There was a governmental lockdown in place. You are not to evangelize in the name of Jesus, they were told. Moreover, they were told under no circumstances were they allowed to even preach or talk in the name of Jesus. And then the seriousness of all of that was confirmed with a beating that they were not to preach in that name anymore. They took the beating. So after taking that beating, what did they do? I suppose they all went home and they began to petition their representatives to please lift the restrictions. Since other sects were able to go out. Other organizations were allowed to go out and preach their message. Other organizations were allowed to protest and burn down buildings and destroy cars and ruin business to express their dissatisfaction. 
So they would say, will you please let us preach the good news of peace and unity and salvation, just like those people are able to. No, no, not at all. They did not do that. This is what they did. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. That right there, my friends, was the motive, motive of that first church and the first Christians. It was their motto. It was their life verse, so to speak. Everywhere they went, they spoke about Jesus. Everyone they met, they told about Jesus and his saving grace. They sometimes paid for it, mind you, with their own blood. They cared about the marks of a true disciple in their bodies, meaning they bore the marks or the scars of the beatings they had endured for the sake of the gospel and for the name of Jesus. But they refused to be silenced. They now were responsible for carrying and spreading the words of life, the very words of life. And they took their responsibility serious. And look at what happened. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. The key is to preach. Preach Jesus in him crucified and your message will be confirmed by accompanying signs and wonders and miracles and healings. If you don't stretch your faith, nothing can be measured out to you. I want us to revisit what Jesus said in, in Mark chapter 4, verse 24 and 25. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Jesus is simply saying, use your faith and you will receive a reward. The more you use, the more you re will receive and the more will be added unto you. Jesus said that all you need is a mustard seed of faith. Understand, please. Understand that a mustard seed might start out small. It might start out as small as of all the garden seeds, but it grows into the hugest of the garden plants. And it grows into the faith-moving mountain. It moves mountain. By faith is, is the mountain moving faith. And it doesn't have to take very long. They don't, you don't have to spend years and years, decades and decades trying to muster up this faith. This faith is given to you and it's given to me. It's given to your family and to my family. We have this mustard seed of faith. It is up to us to nurture and to grow this mustard seed of faith into a plant that will grow and grow and become the largest of all the garden plants until it comes to a mountain moving faith. Because remember, the measure you use, that measure will be measured back to you and still more will be added. That's why Peter and John were so confident when they said, silver and gold I have not, but what I do have give I unto you. And then proceeded to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk in full confidence that it would be as they said. That is why people could bring handkerchiefs and aprons 
and place it on Paul's body, and demons would come out screaming. Diseases would be healed. That's why they would take the sick people and place it in the path where, where uh, Peter would be walking, and just his shadow would fall upon them as he passed by, and just his shadow would heal these people. I want you to also watch this. Watch this. Peter did not have some false sense of humility concerning the miracle that he had just performed. He didn't throw up his hands and say, oh, it was Jesus. Look at what he did say, Acts chapter 3 verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? He took responsibility for what he had done, but he gave the glory to Jesus. He did not try to say that it was him, who, who, who his power, who performed it. He said, yes, I did it. I made this man walk, but it was not by my own righteousness, nor was it by my own power, but it was by the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by whose stripes you are healed. We also need to understand that gifts through faith is not for private use. It is not to be used to build your social media following. It is for the church, the body of Christ, to be built up. Each one of us is given a certain measure of faith. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 3 through 6. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. We use our gifts and our faith to build up the body of Christ. And we do it unto the Lord. Not for views, not for self-promotion, but in love and in humility, building up the body of Christ, and women lost souls to the Lord. Everything we do must be laced with love. See what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 38? Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. It is always at the measure you use it. You want to know the ROI? Just take a look at the investment. For the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Remember the parable of the sower, and his disciples came and asked why he spoke in parables. Let us listen to Jesus. This was his answer. We're going to read from the NLT. The New Living Translation. Matthew chapter 13, verse 12 through 15. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. And they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. This is why I use these parables. This is Jesus speaking. This isn't, isn't one of the disciples. This is Jesus. For they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, When you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. 
For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes, and their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. When we hear but do not listen, we do not understand. We will see, but we will not perceive. It is hearing mixed with faith. But if we listen to Jesus' teaching, more understanding will be given to us and we will have an abundance of knowledge. But we have to act on our faith. We cannot leave it lying dormant. It is not those who hear only. Because you can hear, but not actively listen. And make the word of God of no effect. But it is those who hear and put it into action who will prosper from this teaching. James, like, likewise, tells us that faith without action is dead. Inaction renders faith impotent. I want to say that again. Inaction renders faith impotent. What's the bottom line? Here's the bottom line. You must listen to hear. Once you hear, you must now mix what you have heard with faith. Once mixed, you must put it into action. You must preach the good news of the gospel everywhere and to everyone. Everything we do, we do it to that Jesus might be lifted up. And then your faith will be rewarded and then even more will be added to you. And you will have an abundance like Peter and Paul. So, would you like to have that kind of faith? Would you like to have to partner with Jesus? That you preach the good news. You tell your testimony and Jesus confirms it with miracles. Would you like to have that kind of faith? Well, if you would like to have that kind of faith, first you have to have a relationship with Jesus. You have to have an active, vibrant relationship with Jesus. So do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? He's coming back real, real soon. And he's coming back only for those who know him, his disciples, those who are waiting for his return. If you don't know who Jesus is, but you would like to know who Jesus is, you would like to take him as Lord and Savior. Here's how you do it. All you got to do is to say this prayer with me. Believe it. And Jesus will credit it to you and save you. So, say this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Lord, help me to have faith. Increase my faith. Help me to recognize that mustard seed that you've given me, that portion of faith that you've given me. Help me to live for you. Give me boldness and confidence that I might share the good news. And then, Lord, stretch forth your hand and confirm our words with your power, with your might, and perform many, many miracles in your name that you might receive honor, that you might receive glory, Lord Jesus. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get yourself a Bible. 
Begin to read your Bible. You got to read your Bible every day. You got to stay in the Word. You got to commit it to memory. You got to learn, understand what it was that Jesus was telling us. You got to build up your faith. Highlight those verses, those verses that are meaningful. Highlight those verses and learn them. Commit them to memory. Find yourself a Bible believing church. Not one of those lukewarm churches or one of those progressive churches or one of those churches that are more interested in serving lattes in their entryway. What I want you to do is to find a Bible believing church that believes that God still does miracles. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that he called you to do. That's to have faith. He's looking for faith. Will he find faith upon the earth? Will he find us doing what it is that he, will, he wants us to be doing, that he called us to do? And he said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. Well, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you joining us. We appreciate you tuning in every week. And I want to say the Lord Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.